and the guards, uh, at Nash, uh, state police, national guards came in shooting. The first thing they did is they had a helicopter fly over. They dropped tear gas and then they came in shooting and they shot 39 people to death, including a third of the hostages. That voice you're hearing there was the voice of Eddie Lashour telling his story in the Attica prison riot, an event from the early 1970s which he was directly involved with. And he shares that experience with us, the experience of being in prison during a prison riot and the horrible trauma that ensued. 39 people were killed from the Attica prison riots. It was a terrible event in our nation's history. And it's a pretty rare opportunity to get to speak to somebody who played such such a part, was, was there for it, lived through it, actually experienced the event when the Attica prison was taken over by inmates with a list of demands. And Governor Nelson Rockefeller of New York decided to unleash the National Guard. But in and of itself, it's just a traumatic story. And I think what's particularly valuable about what Eddie shares with us in this podcast is how he grew from this story and how it shaped his life and how it shapes him as a meditation coach. He runs a meditation practice called A Mindful Emergence. The website's amindfulemergence.com. His practice is out of Asheville and please feel free to look him up. He's a great coach and teacher of meditation. And he shares with us his personal experience of having lived through the Attica prison riot and how he grew from it and how it shaped him. So without further ado, this is my conversation with Eddie LaShore. So it's just another process addiction. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully we're going to be exploring some of that as we talk here today. So, again, thanks, or I should say thanks for coming out. Oh, this is great. I've been yeah. looking forward to this. Cool. Well, Eddie, you know, we uh, we met just a few months ago, mm-hmm. and we've uh, encountered each other in a few contexts since then. Uh, you came and spoke at the group, and... Uh, I got to attend one of one of your meditation groups, but I, you know I don't really know uh, much about your background. You shared a little bit, and so we're going to kind of explore some of that. Um, and, and where I'd like to, where I usually begin is, uh, is just asking you where you're from. You know, yeah. where did you grow up? Well, I grew up on a dairy farm in upstate New York, huh. outside an idyllic little community called Watkins Glen which is this beautiful little town in the Finger Lakes. And I tell people that I grew up with Ozzie and Harriet Nelson, except we were on a dairy farm. Yeah. So my mom was a school teacher. My dad was a dairy farmer. And it was a good life, you know. Uh, We were kind of middle class. I never had to worry about, is there going to be food? I, I, I didn't sense any danger. And my parents were good people, just really good people. Now, that doesn't mean that they were perfect parents, if there is such a thing. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, 
But, you know, my, my mom was uh, a daughter in a family of 13 where the parents were immigrants from Eastern Europe. And she grew up in the, uh, both of them grew up in the Depression era. So there was an attitude of like, well, you know, we can't have too much fun here. Mm -hmm. And I was subjected to a lot of, um, it's never good enough what you're doing. You know, whatever, if you get a B plus, you should have gotten an A. If you'd gotten an A, it should have been an A plus. So there was a lot of pressure and she was somewhat critical. So that did have an impact on me. Yeah. But in the grand scheme of things, you know, especially when I hear other people who have been in active addiction and I listen to their stories about what they went through, uh -huh. I think, man, I had it easy. Yeah. You know, went to a small high school, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then... Do you have brothers and sisters? I have a sister who's 10 years older than I am. Okay. And she actually graduated early from high school. So by the time I was in first grade, she was gone. Yeah. You know, she was off at an Ivy League school. Uh-huh. And, you know, the good news is the same as the bad news. The good news was she was an amazing student. I mean, like genius and overachiever. The bad news part of that is that I was expected to follow in her footsteps. Yeah. So yeah, even I though I was a pretty good student, you know, I was held up to that bar and viewed as kind of a screw up. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I developed a lot of resentment around that. And I couldn't wait to get away from home. Yeah. So w was it a, in, uh, an active dairy farm? Like y'all Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. you milked the cows? Oh, I did it all, man. I, <laughs> you, you name anything that happens at a dairy farm, and I was involved. I met a dairy farmer in Ireland who told me that some cows are left-handed and some are right-handed. I mean, you have to approach some from the left side and some from the right. Well, I don't know if that's true. If my dad ever told me that, I must have forgotten. <laughs> yeah. but, but you spent a lot of time with milking cows. Yeah, I mean, we had equipment. You had machines yeah. that you hooked up. But yeah. if the power went out, you, you can't just not milk the cows, Dan. Yeah. You know, you, so I know I had the motion down. I knew how to milk them by hand. Yeah. And, you know, I shoveled cow shit and yeah. you know drove tra i was driving tractors when i was like seven or eight years old and yeah. you know it was it was good and i you know i grew up out in the country and then i could wander around and the neighbor boy he had horses uh they had horses so when we played cowboys and indians as you tend to do yeah uh, we did it on horseback okay real <laughs> cowboys <laughs> yeah i mean you know we really did it up so it, it was it was pretty good, and I actually did not get involved with abusing substances until I left home, okay. which again is unusual. Most people who spend time in active addiction, they get started 12, 13, 14. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it wasn't really until I went away to college. Mm -hmm. you know? So I was kind of in a, a bit of a cocoon in a small town. I didn't even know, even know how to pronounce marijuana, much less get my hands on it. Yeah, so you grew up in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, I got out of high school in 1966. Okay. And so you're in upstate New York. Was mm -hmm. the racetrack there then? Absolutely. Yeah. And I ran track. And the coach used to take us up, and we ran the track. The racetrack? For distance. We would go out and put our miles in running the track. Yeah, wow. And I went, a lot, went to a lot of the races uh -huh. you know, growing up. And back when the race car drivers that people haven't even most people haven't heard of like graham hill and sterling moss and so on yeah i saw those guys drive uh-huh um so yeah that was a big part we had races throughout the year and yeah so that was part of the community and mm -hmm. played a little bit of sports i was a pretty good athlete yeah mm -hmm. what'd you play uh i played uh some football uh -huh. ran track yeah played a little basketball yeah yeah so grew up kind of all American, it sounds like. Kind of like, except I was really, I was different. Yeah. You know, uh, when other people were listening to the Everly Brothers and Elvis, I was listening to jazz. I was listening to Miles Davis. and. How'd you find that stuff? Well, my sister. Okay. She was going to an Ivy League school and she was very hip. Yeah. So she would bring me, my first jazz album she gave me when I was maybe 12 years old. It was a Miles Davis record. Mm -hmm. And she gave it to me along with a Stravinsky record, The Rite of Spring. 
Yeah. And uh, I was listening to other stuff, and she said, I don't know if you're going to like this or not, but, you know, just put it on and check it out. And if you don't like it, just take it off. But, you know, pull, keep pulling it out every once in a while. And one day I put it on and I went, ooh, wow, what's going on here? This is really good. And I had a couple of friends that were into it. So we had our little sort of click. We, we thought of ourselves as like the cool kids. We were listening to jazz. And then she's giving me all these great books. You know, I'm reading Catcher in the Rye and yeah. really good stuff, you know, really uh-huh. rich, good, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird, really good literature and yeah. uh, doing this stuff. And I was kind of a beatnik, you know, when I was yeah. in high school. Uh-huh. Uh, I was real awkward around girls. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, I was a virgin until I got to college. I didn't, you know, so yeah, I, I was kind of odd in that way. Uh Um, but, but high school was okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Still playing sports and able to get by socially, you know, had some friends, didn't have any major problems, got Uh in a couple fights, but Uh it's not like, you know, I had to grow up like and some people did, and some in very difficult environments. Yeah, yeah, so. right. So you graduated high school, you said, in 66? Yeah, 66. Yeah. So what you, would you do after that? Well, I, I went to college. And I, the thing is that, and I, I hate to put it this way, because I don't want to get into blame, but in a, I just have to say, my mom kind of spoiled my enthusiasm for academics by putting so much pressure on me. So, uh, you know... I mean, I was smart enough, I could have gone to a really good school, but I just went to a community college. And honestly, I didn't really care about learning anything. But 1966, you know, we're talking about Vietnam was starting to kick in, the draft. Yeah. So if you weren't in college uh, to get a deferment, they were going to draft you and send you off to Southeast Asia. Right. And that was something I was not interested in doing at all. I was opposed to the war. So I went away to college. And uh, got very involved in radical politics and anti-war stuff and civil rights stuff. And I went down to D.C. in 68 when uh, Uh, they had all the moratoriums and the marches and got tear gassed. And so I I became, you know, really uh, radically uh, political. Yeah. But that was those were the times. Right. And at the same time, I, you know, in 66, 67, I started, I think 67, I started getting into drugs. And um, basically anything that straight society was uh, disapproving of, I did it. You found that. (laughs) Anything that I thought my parents didn't like, sign me up. I'm there. That's what I want to do. Was it related to rebellion or was it just sniffing out that there was some kind of substance underneath the facade of 50s America? I'd like to say that there was like a some kind of spiritual pursuit involved, but I think mostly is I wanted to be cool. And I thought that's what, what's what being cool meant, you know, grew my hair out, got loaded, uh, did all this stuff. I did have some political consciousness, you know, I mean, I was starting to get a sense of like, okay, this is how the system works and what are we doing in Vietnam? And I kind of was able to see through the bullshit, you know, that, (laughs) <laughs> Lyndon yeah. Johnson was telling us and yeah. so on. And I was really, really irate about the way that uh, African-Americans were being treated. And I think a lot of that was because I'd been listening to so much jazz and I identified with the culture and their plight. And I had read stories about how musicians and also I was into sports, how baseball players, you know, yeah. I would read about how, you know, why did it take? Major League Baseball so long before they integrated. Yeah. And how were these athletes treated? So I had I had a consciousness there. Uh, but the other part of it was I was hurting. Yeah. I, I felt really alienated. And I just didn't like the way I felt. Yeah. Um, I was really angry at my parents. Yeah. And I think 90% of it was unjustified, but that was the outlet. And, you know, I was pissed off at the government. I was mad at my mom because she was such a hard ass, I yeah. thought, you know, so it's just, and I was caught up in, these are the 60s, Dan, you know, yeah. this this is like the the mood and the tone of the times. Yeah, right, which, you know, things were changing, 
Uh, but I think it's interesting how, how you're describing it and it just, just listening to it and imagining it. You know, being in your 20s, I mean, I didn't get to grow up in the 60s, but, you know, I was angry and uh, politically uh, more active and, and, you know, very into music and countercultural things. Um, but, it, you know, just the emotion is, is there, the charged emotions yeah. and the yeah. action but you can't necessarily identify uh, what the emotions are. And I, I like how you put that you were hurting, but you probably didn't know that. I was yet. shut down. Yeah, yeah. Emotionally, I was really shut down. And yeah, that, that right. lasted until I was in my mid-30s. Yeah, yeah. I was scared of my feelings. I couldn't yeah. access them. I couldn't communicate them, yeah. articulate them. Yeah. But, but action was happening. Action was happening. Yeah. And, you know, if there was something to do where I could vent my anger... Then I was there. How did the drug start? Well, I was in college and I had a roommate whose name, interestingly enough, was uh, Steve Martin. Okay, yeah. But not, not our banjo not picking the, friend. Yeah, right. And uh, one night, uh, he pulled out uh, some hash and really strong stuff. And I said, yeah, I want to try this. And I smoked it, and I thought I had found God. I mean, I must have looked like an idiot. I was walking around the room, you know, like, da, 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 you know, like just... And he had some kick-ass music on, probably, you know, Cream or, yeah. you know, something and Zeppelin, I don't know. And that was it. That was it. Uh, I had never experienced feeling like that. Yeah. And that, that was it. And for the next four years, I don't know if I got through a day without getting high. Mm-hmm. You know, so it started with marijuana and hash, and then it just kept... Next thing you know, it was uh, mescaline and LSD, and I did a lot of... A lot of trips. Mm-hmm. I never had a bad trip. Mm-hmm. Talk some other people down off bad trips. I never really got into coke, but I got into mm-hmm. pills, and you know, I like the downers, you know. Mm-hmm. So I got into pills, and then in 1968, uh, President Nixon, in his infinite wisdom, <clears throat> uh, decided to set up a, a program called Operation Intercept, and they put a big push on sealing off the border with Mexico and stop the flow of marijuana coming across the border. That was a primary oh. source at that time. And uh, so I couldn't get weed. And, you know, my, my mind state was, well, I need to get high, you know, because I didn't know anything else, right? Yeah. And then I got, somebody said, well, I have something else that'll work. And it was heroin. Mm-hmm. And that's when I started with heroin. And I started sniffing it, snorting it. And, and then it was just a matter of time. It's like needles. Started mm-hmm. using needles. Was the Timothy Leary rum, dot, uh, Chris Alpert yeah. stuff going on? Was yeah, all that, that stuff was happening, yeah. yeah. And I knew about uh, uh, Timothy Leary. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that was the acid, acid stuff was going on. Yeah. You know, so I was doing everything. Everything I could yeah. get my hands on. And, you know, it's like I've heard people say... My drug of choice was more. Yeah. It almost didn't matter what. Yeah. Just give me more. Just give me more. Just change my state. And the interesting thing is, is that in 68, I didn't have to worry about the draft anymore hmm. because I failed my draft physical. Hmm. Uh, long story short, I transferred from one school to another. And um, I went from a bi-semester system to a tri-semester di- system. And it's like... I, I know you're familiar with the word titrate. It's like they titrated my hours down. <laughs> yeah, right. They adjusted the amount of hours that I had gotten credit for. Uh-huh. So I dropped below the amount of hours that you're supposed to re- sustain yeah. to uh, keep your 2S draft deferment. So they all of a sudden classified me as 1A. Yeah. And there was a big, oh, shit moment. Yep. And uh, so I knew right, right away, I am not going to Vietnam. That is not going to happen. And I had a Canadian girlfriend, and she said, well, you can move up to Canada with me. So I actually went to Canada, and I applied for what they called social 
a landed immigrant status. Hmm. And you get a social insurance card. And at that time, it was a lot easier to get in. So, you know, there's a point system. And it was easy to accumulate enough points. You know, if you get enough points, then they'll give you landed immigrant status, which is legal, uh, legal status, you know, until you can become a citizen. So I found out, yeah, I can move up here and do it legally. And so that was my plan if I passed my physical. Because what they do is you, you pass, and then they give you about three weeks to get all your stuff together before you report to Fort Dix for yeah. basic training. So I went yeah. to my physical ready to do that. But before I went for my physical, I had talked to some people who were educating those of us who were facing the draft on how to get out of it. Yeah. And what I learned was that if you went for your physical and just went in and said, well, I got bad feet, or I got bad eyes, or I got a problem with this or that, well, it probably isn't going to help. You needed to bring something from a doctor. And I had gotten my foot mangled a little bit by a lawnmower when I was about 12. And I had all my toes and everything, but there was a lot of scar tissue on the side. And uh, it took a long time to heal. So I went to the doctor and I said, Doc, can you give me some kind of letter that I can take for my physical uh, that talks about what had happened? And this guy happened to be Quaker. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're pacifists. So he, he, and I said, Doc, I'm not asking you to do anything unethical. And he just looked at me, he kind of nodded his head. And he goes, I know what to do. So he wrote up this letter saying, you know, graphic detail, you know, all these things that happened to my foot nerve damage and all this stuff. He said, as a result of this, Edward, which was my legal name, he must wear special shoes. Well, what he meant was that I had to wear wider shoes for a while, but it was left open to interpretation. So when I went for my physical and they saw that, it's like, oh, this guy's got bad feet. So they gave me a one Y deferment, which basically meant they could only draft me in terms of all out war or a national emergency. So I, I had that off my neck so I could go to school part-time. And in the meantime, I was working professionally in radio. Okay, yeah. So, you know, my job was basically to go in and play music and then do a few other things, read news and do stuff like you that. You were a DJ. I was a DJ yeah. and an announcer. So, I mean, being loaded wasn't necessarily a big problem. Yeah, right. I mean, I wasn't driving heavy construction equipment here. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> or trying to teach, you know, at a yeah. university. I was, you know... So this was my life. I was going to school part-time. Uh, I was getting high a lot. I was working professionally in radio. And then I was getting, you know, causing as much trouble as I could. Yeah. Uh, so upstate New York, late 60s. Yeah. What about Woodstock? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta ask. One night, some guys came to the house, and they had a brochure. And they said, you got to check this out, man. There's a concert coming up. It's about 100 miles from here. Look at this. Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Crosby. And they're going down the list. Yeah. And we're going, we got to go. Everybody that I knew went. But I couldn't go because I had just changed jobs from one radio station to another. Uh -huh. And I, I mean, literally a week before then. So it's not like I could go in and say, hey, I know I just started work for you. But could you give me just a few days off? Yeah. So they all went, and my tent, and my sleeping bag, <laughs> which I never saw again. Yeah, right. And then they all came stumbling back. I didn't yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm at the radio station, and I'm getting these um, messages coming over, urgent, urgent, off, off the wire service. Uh -huh. UPI, United Press International, saying, you know, don't go, don't go. The New York State Thruway is closed. All the yeah. roads are closed. You can't get in. I'm supposed to make these announcements. And I'm going, I wonder if my buddies even got in there. And, yeah. you know, what's going on? And, yeah. boy, it's a good thing I didn't go. And, of course, later it's like, God, I missed, you know, Woodstock. Yeah, well, but you know, even the people who went, they don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Okay, so, so the drugs had, had really started at oh, this yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it, it kind of progressed from one to it another did. and did. You, you mentioned gotten into pills and then mm -hmm. into to heroin. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a dangerous, uh, I was walking on the edge Yeah, for sure. And I was dealing with some pretty unsavory characters. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think anything of going down into Spanish Harlem to cop. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I walked into this place and there was a guy lying there on the stoop with a needle stuck in his arm and he was, he'd already started turning black. Mm. And one guy I knew that was a supplier, he got shot to death because he stiffed his source and the guy just gunned him down. 
Yeah. And and I was the guys I was running with at one point. One of them said, "You know, maybe we should get guns." <laughs> and I'm thinking, what? Wow. Wait a minute here. Yeah, that was uh, like a moment of yeah. clarity. Yeah, yeah, but you know, it didn't stop me from using. Right. I mean, it was it was like, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not packing heat. I'm not going there. Yeah. But it wasn't too long after that that I got busted. So you know, okay. it sort of became a moot point. Yeah. And you were in New York at the time? I was in New York State. I was living in a little town called Corning, New York, working okay. professionally in radio at WCBA Radio. And mm-hmm. it just I finished my, got my associate's degree mm-hmm. I, with a C average. I was, <laughs> I was, a, I was a, uh, a real underachiever, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> really yeah. yeah well you knew what it took to get by and you know, I didn't give a shit a lot about on. school you yeah, know and it's really yeah. a shame because you know I could have gone and you know like to do be doing what you're doing going on and you know gotten a PhD and maybe taught in a university become a counselor but yeah you know that's that just wasn't my journey sure right I mean it just wasn't it, it could have it could break any which way for any of us yeah. according to the slightest factor yeah. you know yeah but but Tell us about, uh, you know, how you got busted, what that was like. Well, the way it worked with me and uh, getting and using drugs was I would buy, I would get a quantity Mm -hmm. and then I would divide it up and sell some of it and sell enough to pay for what I was using. So I didn't have to go out and knock off a liquor store or roll a roll of drunk or anything like that. I was I was a fairly functional addict. <laughs> yeah. You know, in that sense. So sometimes, you know, I would sell to people I knew. Mm-hmm. I wasn't hanging around the schoolyards or hey, psst, yeah, you know, just a few acquaintances. And a guy and that I knew top, but yeah. not real well got busted on a possession charge and the local police department said, uh, you're going to the big house, fellow. Unless you get us a dealer. Mm. So he came and uh, asked asked me to sell him some heroin. And I, I was actually a little bit hesitant because I didn't know him real well. But I was also at that time desperate for some money. So I sold him some and he walked went straight to the police station, turned it in. And then they came out with a, a sealed indictment on a bench warrant. And uh, I was picked up. I was actually doing my radio show. And I turned, like, I'm sitting in front of a mic, just like I am now. <laughs> and, and I turned around, and there are police, uh, like yeah. many of them, mm. with handcuffs. And they took me away. And I was arrested uh, for criminal sale of a dangerous drug, heroin. Mm. And uh, it was like, oh, wow. This is not good here. Mm. And at that point, my parents had moved uh, to Florida, and they were already pretty disgusted with me because I was kind of a screw up. Mm. And, and they just washed their hands. They said, you got yourself in this, you get yourself out of it. And I can't blame them, honestly, you yeah. know? And so I didn't have the means to get a, a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, so I got a court appointed attorney. And court appointed attorneys uh, don't get paid very much. Right. So their, their thing is plea bargaining. They're plea, they're deal makers. Yeah. Basically, what a what a court appointed attorney does is they come into the DA and say, "Well, what can he plea down to?" They just want to, and I'm not saying they don't keep it rolling. They don't care about. I'm not going to say that they don't care about their clients, but they don't care that much. (laughs) They're not really interested in going to trial. And the truth is, if I had taken it to trial. It was this guy's word against mine. And I was facing the possibility of 15 years, and I pled down to a lesser charge of uh, a lower charge. I went from third degree to fourth degree, and I was facing seven. Mm. And my attorney told me that if I took the deal, that I would get a five-year sentence that would involve a year in a minimum security facility where I would get some drug treatment. And then I would be on kind of a parole type situation for four years. And he also told me that if we went to trial, uh, that I was, I, I was going to be screwed. We couldn't win this thing. Yeah. And uh, so I said, okay, 
uh, I, I took the deal. I went in and I pled and I walked in. And there was a lot of politics going on, Dan. The, the judge was retiring and the DA who was prosecuting, he was on a Get Tough on Drugs program and he was actually wanting to take over the judgeship that was, yeah. soon, to, was soon to be vacated. And I was, I was the guy he wanted to get the pound of flesh from. Yeah. And uh, so the judge gave me seven years. He gave me maximum and sent me to Attica, uh, Attica Correctional Facility. <laughs> it's a euphemism. It was a prison. It's a maximum security prison in upstate New York. And as soon as he gave me seven years and, you know, he gave me this little lecture and told me I was the scourge of society and all this and sent me to seven years. And I looked at my attorney and he wouldn't make eye contact with me. Uh, and I was like, OK. Wow. Uh, so next day they loaded me in and took me up to Attica. And, and my first cell, I was locked between two guys doing life for first degree murder. I was like, oh OK, gosh. this this is another this is not good moment. Um, yeah. And so meanwhile, you're coming down from... Well, I had kicked in, in um, county jail. I was in county yeah. jail for three months. So I had to go okay. through base, a detox with no support in county jail. Yeah, cold turkey. Yeah, it was, it was not fun. Bad yeah. case of the flu times 10. Yeah. What a turn of events. Yeah. I was 22 years old. Uh, I really oh didn't gosh. know anything. Uh, yeah. I wasn't savvy in the way of the world, you know, these yeah. ways. I certainly didn't know the court system. Um, yeah, that's how it was. And so you find yourself in prison. Yeah, I'm in Attica. And um, so they assigned me to the school. They actually had a school there. And um, because I actually had a degree, yeah. uh, they said, oh, you're going to be a teacher. And it, it was what was called cell study. Uh-huh. And cell study is basically like a, a correspondence thing. Guys do lessons in their cell, and then they put it in an envelope, and then a runner picks them up, takes them up to the school, and, they, and then I open them up and correct them, and then give them the next lesson, and they go back. So I taught mm-hmm. music and math, mm-hmm. and that's what I taught. And um, that's, that's what I did, and then basically try to keep, you know, from getting raped. You know, I had to. I, oh I had been. Gosh. I had been schooled on that, like what to do and what not to do. And I had to. I had to stand a guy up against the wall and make a big show of force, uh, so they didn't think I was some punk that they could take advantage of. And you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not a tough guy, but you got to put on the act. You know. Yeah. So I did this, and they left me alone. Fortunately, they didn't corner me somewhere, and I didn't have to deal with that. Oh yeah, right. Uh, and then I made some friends, and one of my friends was a guy named Sam Melville who uh, had been sent to Attica for blowing up some buildings in New York City. He was labeled the Mad Bomber. And he was connected to the anarchists. Is this like Weather Underground people? He was connected to the Weather Underground. He was such an anarchist that he wouldn't even associate with those guys. He he was this lone wolf, you know. He's a famous guy. Uh, There are books about him. And he became like my bud. And uh, so I went to graduate school in radical politics mm. and started reading Marx and Lenin and studying this stuff. And is this like 1970? Or? This was 1970. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're, you're, you're keeping up here with okay. math. This is good. Yeah. 1970. All right. And so I'm becoming like a really hardcore, uh, ideological radical at this point. Okay. And this is all taking place at a time where the whole prison system and all of society was becoming further radicalized. Uh, there were these figures going, you know, as, as part of culture, Angela Davis and George yeah. Jackson, and of course, mm. Eldridge Cleaver and yeah. Huey Newton and all these people. And the Black Panthers were really big. Yeah. And I related to these people and um, I, I felt I was part of them. And uh, so I really became part of like a political underground at Attica and... Uh, one of the things that happened is that there was a class, there were actually two actual classes going on in, in the school where students came together and met in a classroom. One was a, was a, um, 
a language class, a French class, which, uh, interestingly enough, was being taught by the guy who was the mastermind of the drug deal that turned into the movie The French Connection with Gene Hackman. Yeah, right. In the, in the movie, he gets away. In real life, he was busted and sent to prison, and his name was Francois Scaglia. He was from Marseille, France. He was a buddy of mine, and he taught the French class in there. Yeah. <laughs> the real French connection. The, right? This was, yeah. Wow. And, and okay. then the other, cl- the other class was a sociology class taught by a guy who had actually been a, um, a Ph.D.-level instructor at Skidmore University who got busted for selling, uh, supplementing his college income by selling uh, LSD to students. He got popped and sent to Attica. So they said, oh, well, this looks good. We can say we have a sociology course. Well, what happened was it became a gathering place for the radicals from the different parts of the prison because Attica is segregated off into four separate prisons. So, you know, you might know somebody in a different block, but you never get to see them. Yeah. So this way they could all come. They all would sign up for this class. Well, the sociology class was basically a meeting place for all these radicals to get together and strategize and like, okay, what can we do to build consciousness inside the prison and fight oppression? Yeah. And uh, wow. Bill was eventually par- uh, paroled. And then I was given, that was the only other guy, I think, with a college Bill degree. Was... Bill Coons, the guy that was the sociology teacher okay. from Skil- Skidmore. Yeah. He, he was paroled. So... I took over the class. So here I am running this class, and there's Sam Melville, and there's all these other people. (laughs) And, you know, Black Panthers and guys from the Young's Lords Party and all these. And they're getting together, and they're talking about, yeah, well, we should get a hold of this person. We need to get the media in here, and we got to do this and expose that and blah, 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 and improve conditions. And then what happened was the... The, 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 the authorities got wind of this and they, they busted me and threw me in the hole, threw me in what's called segregation, uh, punitive segregation, but it's basically the hole, the box. So wait, these guys are scheming in your class. Yeah. And then... And I'm scheming with them. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah I wasn't a bystander. Yeah, no. yeah, right. You're, you're kind of the ringleader in, in one sense. I that, wouldn't say the ringleader, the teacher. But, okay. but yeah, I was, I was definitely active in that. Yeah, okay. Um, and you took the fall there? Yeah, I took the fall, and um, so they locked me up, and um, it's, it, so I get, <laughs> I go to the warden, right? So he says, what's going on with this? You know, and he wanted me to give names of all these people, and what's going on? And basically, I, I said, I'm not, uh, hey, look, I'm not, a, I'm not a rat. I'm not telling you anything. Yeah, right. And he goes, well, well, you know, I got, I know what to do with guys like you. 30 days, loss of good time, 30 days in the uh, 30 days punitive segregation. What do you think of that? And I looked at him and I said, 30 days? I can do 30 days standing on my head. (laughs) (laughs) Obviously more more guts than brains. Uh, Okay. (laughs) And he said, let's make it 60. I'll give you another 30 then to do standing on your feet. He gave me 60 days in the hole. And then they sent me off. But the interesting thing happened is that when I was in the box, that saved my life. Because when I was in the box, the Attica riot jumped off. thrown in the box in early August of 1971. Okay. I'd been in Attica by that time, about a year. And the riot took place on September 9th. And there was an incident that happened. And basically, uh, the prisoners uh, took over a section of the prison, and then it spread to include about half the prison. So out of about 2,300 inmates, or almost 1,200 of them, in uh, one of the yards holding about 35 hostages, employees, guards, and other employees. Yeah, Yeah, this was September 1971. So were these the people who were scheming in your sociology Some of them were. And the interesting thing is a lot of the discussions that took place in that meeting 
ended up being demands that were formulated and given to the state as conditions to release the hostages. In fact, actually what happened is before the riot, they were written up and sent to the warden. And guess who typed them up in the school? They gave it to me, and I typed them up, and I gave them to these guys. They sent them off to the, the actually, the commissioner of corrections, Russell, Russell G. Oswald. Okay. Then I was popped. I was put in this little prison inside the prison. Then the riot jumps off, and the guy said, well, guess what, Commissioner Oswald? You didn't listen to our demands before when we sent, so now they're the conditions for you getting these 35 hostages back alive. So they, these were the demands. There were originally 28, and then they added three more, and uh, which, one of which was amnesty for any crimes that were committed in the takeover of the prison. But when the riot is taking wow. place, I'm in the box. Yeah. Because that area of the prison was not taken over by the prisoners. If I hadn't been in the box, I actually was in the section housed and working in the section of the prison that was taken over by the prisoners, and I would have been in the yard. I would have been in the yard. Is that where they... And that's what happened on the 13th. They finally, the negotiations broke down. Governor Rockefeller said, you could take, take back the prison by any means necessary. I don't think he used that exact phrase. I don't think he quoted Malcolm X. Uh, but you, you take back the prison, and the guards, uh, at Nash, uh, state police, national guards came in shooting the first thing they did is they had a helicopter fly over, they dropped tear gas, and then they came in shooting, and they shot 39 people to death, including a third of the hostages, because it was an indiscriminate Gosh. shooting. They killed 39 people. And one of the, one of the things they told the, 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 uh, the prisoners is they had sharpshooters on the roof, and they gave them pictures of guys and they said, when we go in, you make sure, and they had high-powered rifles with scopes. You said, they said, you get these guys. And they had a picture of Sam Melville, and they killed him. They had a picture of a guy named L.D. Barkley, Elliot James Barkley, Elliot Dave Barkley, I guess it is. Uh, they shot and killed him, and they killed a couple of others. And I'm pretty sure they would have given the guys a picture of me, because they hated me, because they viewed me as a ringleader. And then I, the other crime that I had committed in their eyes was I was a white person who was accepted by blacks and Latinos. And they tried to use race to divide people. And anybody who could cross racial lines and be respected was especially dangerous because it didn't fit their strategy of divide and conquer. Yeah. So the fact that I was a smart ass, the fact that I got thrown in the hole might have saved my life. Yeah. Isn't it funny how life has these ironies? Very funny. At, at least looking, I mean, not funny, just uh, maybe ironic. Or you said yeah. ironies. Yeah. yeah. But, I, you know, looking back on it, it makes for a great story. But let's, let's go to when you're in the midst of all this. I mean, what did this feel like? Well, I knew what was going on. Okay. Uh, I could, I, because How many days did it go on? Well, it's, it was the 9th through the 13th. It was five days. Gosh. And... Uh, the interesting thing is in each cell, they had uh, phone jacks. They had a jack where they, you, you could listen to the radio. And uh, so this was normal. They had programming going on, and you could put headphones in and plug it in, and you had a choice of three stations. And they'd have music and different kinds of things. Yeah. Well, during the riot, the, this continued to happen. The guy that was in charge of this continued to do it. So he had a news feed. So I'm sitting in my cell and I'm listening to news stories on CBS and NBC going, well, we're in the third day now of the riot at Attica and blah, blah, blah. Was the prison still operating? Like, were they bringing uh, half, food and stuff? The, the guards were bringing us minimal food. Yeah. But the, the guards, the, the inmates had shut off the water, so we had no running water, which means we mm. couldn't flush the toilets. Yeah. So guys were basically using uh, paper that we had, newspapers and stuff, and defecating in that and then just throwing it across the, the, the walkway. It was getting pretty nasty in there. Yeah. And, you know, they gave us a couple of bologna sandwiches a day and, yeah. and stuff. But then when the riot happened and when the police secured uh, the prison, they, they took 
inmates from the prison that they considered ringleaders and they brought them up and they put them in cells that were vacant in the segregation unit. And some of these guys, so they were then locked next to me. Some of them uh, had been uh, uh, shot. You know, they were moaning and so on. All of them had been severely beaten. Mm -hmm. And then something significant happened the next morning, significant to my story, in that the state police came in in the morning and they were in full riot gear, even though they didn't need to be. Yeah. So they had full riot gear with gas masks and everything. And they had these big oak clubs that the guards used. To, to carry, they carried around with them, and they had this. They had these oak clubs. Yeah. And they said to the guy operating the the cells, "Okay, open cell one." And they popped open cell one, and there was a guy in there that had been out in the yard, presumably as a ringleader. So a couple of them would go in there, and they would just beat the living shit out of this guy, mm. and you could hear bones breaking. I mean, it was Ugh. awful. And then, okay, number two. And then they went into number two. Like, I'm in, like, cell number eight or something. Oh, my God. Right? So, cell number two. Cell number three. And, I, and you know, and you can imagine what's going on, this high, heightened oh sense of gosh. arousal inside me, right? Yeah. Well, when they got to cell number eight, they go, cell number eight. And the guard, who was normally housing, you know, he was securing that unit, he yelled back at the state police, that guy wasn't out in the yard. Mm. So they said, oh, cell number nine. That's, That's how close me. I got to getting beaten. Oh. So I don't have to tell you what imprint that had on me in terms of trauma. Yeah. And uh, then the next day, they took those of us who were not in the riot, who had been in the housing unit, and they took us downstairs, marched us. We had to run the gauntlet. We got beaten a little bit, not too badly. <laughs> and then we got put on a bus and shipped off to another prison that was several hundred miles away. Yeah. And then I was brought back several, about three months after that and interrogated by the uh, state version of the FBI called the BCI, the Bureau of Criminal Investigation. They wanted to try, they were trying to interrogate me to find out, they were trying to build a case against the, you know, to indict prisoners and everything. And of course, I didn't, I didn't have anything to say to them either. So, you know, well, when you said you, that you, you didn't need to tell me about trauma, you know, as a well, psychiatrist, you know, I hear about it, and, and I'm, you know, familiar with hearing people's stories and experiencing things myself. But for, what was it like for you? Well, it was terrifying. And it doesn't really matter whether you get the shit beat out of you or whether... It, the anticipation is bad is as bad as the actual activity in terms of the emotional impact. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it was terrifying to me. And, uh, you know, I carried that with me for a long, long time, for decades. I didn't understand how that had impacted me. Yeah, well, all of those days leading up to it as well. You yeah, know? I mean, yeah. it was all one thing just building and building, yeah, it building. sounds like. Yeah, yeah. Now, and, you know, and just going to prison at the age of 22 and wondering if you're going to yeah. get raped and, yeah. you know, the stuff that the goes on in there, yeah. you know, that obviously is not exactly uh, food for, for, you know, good emotional development, you know. Right, uh, right. So, you know, I was released. I was actually released after two years, about a year after the riot, almost a year, because I was able to get back into court. Uh, long story, my sister stepped in, got a, an appeal specialist, and I was able to get out mm. based on some legal issues uh, and the fact that the, the sentence was ridiculous, Yeah, you know, for, for what I had done as a first offender and all this. So first I, offender. I got out and I got real involved in... in political activity, particularly in education around prisons. And then they they're started having the trials of these guys that were indicted. Uh, they couldn't indict me. There was nothing they could do to, to, to bring charges against me. They could only indict guys that were in the yard. Yeah. So, you know, I, I missed that. But I got to meet people like William Kunstler, who was a famous uh, radical attorney, yeah. and Ramsey Clark, and who at one time was... Um, he was Secretary of State under Kennedy, 
they were involved as defense attorneys for these inmates that had been uh, indicted. And the state never successfully was able to send them away for the, the, you know, kidnapping these, these uh, hostages. Mm. Eventually got thrown out, but I was involved in that. And, and then I just went on with life, you know, as best as I could. first met you, you mentioned that uh, part of your healing journey began in prison. Uh, mm, I would say no. That may have been a, a miscommunication. Well, didn't you say you got a yoga book in prison? Oh, oh. I started doing yoga. <laughs> okay, That's true. Right. Yeah, I got, right. I, I, got, I got a yoga book in prison, and that was, that was Sam Melville. Okay. Uh, he, uh, he, was, he was a yoga practitioner. Yeah, I started doing yoga. But I wasn't doing it. I was just doing it as a physical exercise, sure. like yeah. like calisthenics. Yeah, yeah, right, right. But uh, yeah, I wasn't it's doing it. There was no thing. real inner inner journey yeah. there. There well, was no. You connect. were traumatized, you know. Well, and I just yeah, I didn't get that part. Of it. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah. like okay, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna stretch. Yeah, right. that's what it was about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but wow, what an experience yeah. this whole thing was, and somehow you came out on the other end of it two years later. Coming out of prison after all this, I mean, did did you feel like you dodged bullets literally, or I mean, did you did you feel like what, what was left of your life at that point? You said the legal well, activism. And- I'll, I'll tell you what my whole thing was. All I thought about was I need to carry the message that prisons are messed up, mm-hmm. and I was a political activist. That yeah. was all I thought about. I never reflected on what had happened to me personally. Mm-hmm. I didn't give it any thought. I had behavior now that I can look back on and say it was symptomatic of PTSD, but I didn't understand it then. I mean, the fact that, uh, I mean, even now at the setup we have right now, you don't know this, but I would have been a lot more comfortable if you had put me in that chair over there. Even now, even as much work as I have done, it's uncomfortable with me sitting with a doorway behind me. Mm-hmm. See, so you can imagine what it was like years ago. So, wow. uh, and then just yeah, uh, shutting down, putting up walls, all these kinds of behavior. I didn't, you know, I didn't under. I just thought, and I had panic attacks. I had severe panic attacks, and I didn't understand what they were. I just thought, well, you know, I get kind of nervous sometimes. You know, so this 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 went on for decades, and it wasn't until uh, I actually decided to get into active recovery that I, you know, years later. I mean, I came out at age 24, mm-hmm. and and I never went back to heroin. I didn't go back to LSD, but I, over the next decades, you know, whatever I was involved with, when I, you know, I was doing meditation, I got more into yoga, started a family. I still was a periodic pot smoker, and and. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, drinker and you know, occasional uh, periodic uh, severe abuser, mm-hmm. but um, it never led back to the heroin though. No, no, I didn't go there. Uh-huh. I didn't go there. But you know, and I got jobs and I was real successful at a lot of things. But uh-huh. you know, when I was about thirty-five, I started getting in touch with my own feelings and started doing spiritual exploration. Yeah, uh, and and that opened some doors. Uh-huh. At that point, and I started getting some self awarenesses and started shifting. Yeah. Started doing meditation then. Yeah. You know, I was around 35. When you were 35? About 35, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How did you discover meditation? Well, um, I started actually going to a church, uh, which was kind of a new thought, new age kind of church. And they were just open to a lot of things, including meditation. And I. I saw books by people like Ram Das and Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, we're talking the early '80s, mm-hmm. and um, Ram Das was really the first one. I got a book called *The uh, Journey of Awakening*, and I read about meditation. I was like, "Oh, this would be yeah, I should start doing this." And then I got a hold of some Buddhist material, started reading that, 
And, um, you know, I connected with Thich Nhat Hanh, the, the Zen, the beautiful Vietnamese Zen teacher. Yep. Started reading his stuff, connected with a group. And I really got into Buddhism. Mm. And also at, also at the same time, I got connected with a group in Phoenix where I was living, where I did self-awareness programs that were really patterned after the early Werner Erhard Est uh, programs. Est eventually became Forum, or Landmark Forum. So these are, these are like four-day programs where you, you go in and you really do personal exploration. And it's kind of confrontive. Um, you know, start looking at your thoughts, looking at your behavior, looking mm-hmm. at your attitudes, uh, asking yourself, am I really living in integrity? Uh, you know, what's really getting in the way of me living the kind of life that I want to live? Yeah, so did, were you feeling like there were some obstacles? Oh, yeah. Is what led you to it? Yeah, I mean, the biggest obstacle for me was the fact that uh, I had put up a wall around me. I mean, I actually was told, Eddie, you left Attica, but you brought the walls with you. Yeah. And people knew that and sensed that. And uh, so I, I confronted my inner dragon. I started confronting my shadow and really doing personal work and dealing with um, feelings that I had suppressed or ignored uh, for so long. And, you know, Dan, I had not cried for years. Mm-hmm. I was terrified of, of, of that emotion. Yeah. Uh, I was doing work with teenagers in this church, uh, and it just, it just opened my heart. Yeah. You know, it, and it was, it was transformative for me. The program's called Omega Vector. It was started in uh, the late 70s by this brilliant teacher named George Adair. And I went through it in March of 1985. And it just changed everything for me. Mm. And by that time, I had just started meditating. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, all of a sudden, it's like, wow. You know, I'm actually in touch with my feelings. I'm actually looking at my thoughts. Mm -hmm. This may be be hard to believe, but it was at this point in my life where I had had never really done any kind of introspective thoughts. I had never really stopped and looked at my life. Mm -hmm. I I, I never stopped and looked at my thoughts, my feelings. And believe it or not, it was not until that point that I understood that my life was a result of the choices that I made. It wasn't mm. until then. It's like, oh, really? My life is, is, is a result of the decisions and choices that I make? I mean, this isn't just some kind of random thing. Life doesn't just happen to me. Yeah. You know, and that, I, I look back now, and I'm actually kind of embarrassed to say that I was 35 years old before I had that awareness. Well, I'm but, still figuring but that it out. But <laughs> it, ta- it takes what it takes, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I, I wasn't ready like, until then. Right. And just a simple concept like yeah, that yeah. can just arrive and yeah. really wake yeah. us up and tune us into what's important yeah. in our core values. And who knows why it, it's so elusive yeah. for so many I years, know. you know? I, know? I don't think it's anything to be embarrassed about. I think it's one of those moments of grace, perhaps, yeah. you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, because we, can't, we just can't see it, even if it's right in front of our face sometimes, no. you know? No. Yeah. It's interesting. So I took this program, I went through Omega Vector, I started, mm-hmm. and I took the advanced level courses. And the beauty of these courses was it was done, uh, George Adair set it up where you could do these four day trainings. Okay. And you didn't have to pay. All the teachers, all the staff were volunteer. And then they, at the end, people would say, Well, how can you do this? And they'd say, It's just voluntary contributions. If you're interested in contributing money, then I'll talk to us later. They didn't even pass the basket, hmm. you know, uh, it, and, and, it, and it, you know, it's still going on. 2015, this program, George passed about three years ago, but the work continues. And this is in the Southwest? It's, it's happening. It's based out of Phoenix. Yeah. And I eventually, after I had been involved with the program for a while, I went through a year-long uh, training program to be a facilitator. So I was actually facilitating these programs. Mm-hmm. And, of course, such a great gift to be able to do that. And these are uh, meditation-based and community-based? Or? Not really meditation-based. The idea is, is that you start looking at issues like 
integrity, personal integrity. Are we living our lives on integrity? Mm -hmm. You know, do we keep our word? Mm -hmm. uh, looking at the fact that our behavior is a result of our attitudes and belief systems, and yeah. that very often our behavior is is not in alignment with what our real values are. I mean, I, I believe that intrinsically within every human being, we all have this core of being able to love, being integral, trusting people, that that's, that's at our core. But what happens is, is that we, this gets all covered up with attitudes and belief systems, you know, where all of a sudden it's like, it's not okay to trust. It's not okay to love, you know? And what this program does is it, is it gave people an opportunity to start deconstructing our belief system and say, where did this come from? You know, what are my thoughts and how does it not line up with my visions and my dreams? How does my behavior, particularly being out of integrity, get in the way of me really functioning at my highest level? Mm. And it was just brilliantly conceived uh, programs. It was very interactive. I mean, there was some lecturing, but it was mostly interactive things and stuff that we did. Um, you know, looking at questions like awareness, like what are we aware of? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it was it was so just a beautiful intellectual discussion based, uh, but it was very experiential. Experiential too. Yeah, okay. and and uh, you know, it was transformative. People would stand up to share, and they would go, you know, I never realized, you know, what I'm doing. I never realized uh, that my attitudes, you know, how my attitudes were showing up in my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, people who had visions, had dreams. I'll, I'll tell you one quick story. There was one guy that had been a, uh, an Air Force uh, officer during the Vietnam War. And he, he said, I don't know how many people I killed. He flew bombing missions over North Vietnam. And he says, I never saw where the bombs landed. Mm -hmm. and, now, and he was a retired lieutenant colonel. And there, now he is later in his life, and he says, I can't go back and save those lives. I can't go back. But you know what he did? He started a massive garden and went out and enrolled people in the community and businesses and started a food bank to feed hungry people. And he was growing thousands and thousands of pounds of food, vegetables every week and donating them to St. Mary's Food Bank and all these different places. He said, this is how I can give back. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew people, I knew uh, people who came in, they were so shut down, they couldn't function. And they got in touch with what was in the way of them being highly functional. And they walked out the door uh, being able to face life. Uh, there was a musician who uh, was so terrified, he would not play his piano. He was concert trained, yeah. brilliant pianist. He wouldn't perform in front of even his family. He would only play piano by himself. About three months after the graduation, he did a public recital and a fundraiser for Omega Vector with hundreds and hundreds of people. I mean, mm -hmm. these are transformative experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Deep healing. Deep healing. Yeah. And, and, and I got to be real. part of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what a blessing that must have been. It was amazing. Yeah. And the thing is, in order to, to do those programs... I had to live, I had to practice, I had to stay in integrity. Because yeah. when you stand in front of a bunch of people and talk about the importance of living an integral life and you're not doing it, your words are empty. Yeah. People aren't going to hear you. Yeah. They're just going to fall flat. They don't have any power. You know, we have to live what we are talking about. Vector, yeah, and how that seemed to 
really start to bring some things into focus for you. Yeah. That was a kind of uh, You'd touchstone opened up, moment. Opened up my heart. Yeah. I was really, it was process. I was really processing stuff, a lot of process work. Okay. The big opening for me was when I went to Asia in 90, 92. Okay. So let's see, I was, uh, at that point, I would have been 40, 41 years old. I actually got to go to Nepal and Bhutan and India, and I studied with some big time teachers. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Asian teachers over there, famous teachers. One of them was Sogal Rinpoche, who wrote the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. Okay. Uh, which is a really classic text. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've heard that. But I think that was when I really started getting into really understanding what the practice was about. It was more than just learning to relax. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing learning. Nothing wrong with learning how to relax and be calm. Yeah. But I. I found out it was more than just trying to be relaxed and maybe get a nice peaceful state. It was, I started learning that we start actually investigating our mind, start um, understanding how our mind works, mm-hmm. um, start understanding the nature of like how things work, you know, start understanding uh, teachings of the Buddha like about impermanence and the nature of suffering and this illusion that we have that we're separate from others, that we're this independent self. Mm-hmm. You know, it really started getting in and understanding these things. It also started understanding about compassion and that component, which had completely escaped me. Mm-hmm. I went to talks by the Dalai Lama, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and really understanding, you know, when he says, my, re- my religion is kindness. Well, what does that mean? And how do you practice that? How do you, how do you develop that? What does it mean to really practice you know, and hold a vow of being a bodhisattva, that you want all people to be free? What, what's involved with really holding that aspiration and developing it? So I think that was probably a big breakthrough for me mm-hmm. uh, in the early 90s. So when you talk about understanding impermanence and understanding suffering, those sound like scary things it can be Uh, yeah right and it you know we're naturally averse to that well i'll tell you a quick story i came back from uh, asia and i'd had all these amazing experiences going to holy places Mm -hmm. you know with the energy really profound energy and uh, i came back to phoenix and all of a sudden my life seemed very meaningless Mm-hmm. I was very sensitive to everything. I couldn't watch any news. I couldn't listen to music. I couldn't be around crowds. Uh, I was really raw. Mm. And it really had taken me kind of into the dark night of the soul because it had bumped me up against the sharp edges of my shadow. And it was very tender. And every th- it had been such an intense experience. I hadn't really built up a strong enough foundation in my practice to really hold that space comfortably Mm -hmm. and I felt very impotent it's like what can I do there's so much suffering in the world and who am I you know what can I do and one day I was in a grocery store I was in line and I could tell that the woman at at checkout the woman who was working there was having a hard a hard time Mm -hmm. and the people that she was waiting on were being pretty impatient. And, and when I got up to her, she had a name tag. And let's say the name was Phyllis. Mm-hmm. And I just looked at her and I said, how are you, Phyllis? Are you, how, are you, are you, are you, are you okay? And she just started crying. Mm-hmm. And she kind of fought it back. But it was like I had touched a place of tenderness it was, it was as if I was the first person that had recognized that she was a human being. Yeah. Just by displaying random acts of kindness, you can make a difference. You, and I felt whole again. Yeah. And, you know, and it's like, yeah, I'm going to be okay, too. You know, I just connect with people, be real, care about people, show compassion and kindness. And 
So that was that was real powerful. But yeah, that it, connected you with living the practice. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in a right. real way. Yeah. It wasn't abstract at all. Right. 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 Yeah. So that was real powerful for me. And uh huh. Yeah, because all the noise. <laughs> We got a helicopter flying overhead yeah. right now. But you know, like when you're talking about how you're sensitive to the noise of television and the mm-hmm. news and all the ugliness in the world, and certainly there's oh. tons more noise now with all the internet and oh, yeah. blah blah blah. But uh being able to distill through all that noise to a real experience. Yeah. Yeah, and what's happening right now? I mean, right here in this moment, feeling the floor, feeling my feet on the floor, feeling myself against the chair, my breath, you know, what's going on in this moment, Yeah. you know, anchoring in that, Uh there's something very delicious about that. If I just take that time and do that. Yeah. And then it it cuts through all the worries of the future and the angst about the past. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so you were, you had these moments where you really felt it, and mm-hmm. it kind of drove your curiosity, and you're like, wow, yeah. this, is, this is good stuff here. I want to get some more of this. I want to yeah. feel some more of this presence. So I really became motivated to get deeper into the practice, and I started doing retreats and studying with more teachers. Mm. Uh, so that happened, you know, during the 90s. Mm-hmm. And in the meantime, you know, I had I had a family, you know, in 75 and in 79, my children were born. Okay. You know, so all this time I'm raising a family. Yeah. Um, I'd gone through a divorce, but it was a very amicable one. So mm-hmm. the boy, the, the kid's mom and I, you know, we we co-parented very well. And, mm. uh, and I, you know, I had a job. I was working in sales. And once again, I was kind of the outsiders, just like back in high school. And back in high school, I was kind of different. Yeah. In, 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 in terms of the professional world, I was the guy that was kind of different. I was the sales rep with an earring. <laughs> I was the sales rep that didn't want to go to strip bars yeah. and, and get shit-faced after uh-huh. work. You know, I'd rather go home and meditate. Or what were you selling? Office equipment. Yeah, okay. And I was real good at it. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, um, you know, to me, the, the real important part was this, this process of self-exploration and and deepening my practice and understanding how I can make a difference in the world and just doing the personal work. And and then I was continuing to facilitate the Omega program. So, you know, that gave me a lot of meaning, knowing that I could go in and spend time with a group of people and, and, and be part of this process uh, as they access their own truth mm-hmm. and, and went through their own transformation. I was just a catalyst. Yeah. The way I saw it is when I did these groups, all I was really doing is holding a mirror up for them. Yeah. So they could see with some clarity that they never had before uh, what was going on in their life and what they needed to do. Yeah. You know, what a great gift that is to be able to be part of that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what, yeah. what most therapeutic work is yeah. in, in some way. Yeah. But okay. I still had demons inside yeah. me. You know, I still was going through periods of depression, going through periods of isolation, going through periods of using, where I would isolate and, 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 and uh, numb out. Yep. Because I hadn't really, I hadn't completed my work yet. I, I didn't understand how the trauma was impacting me. Yeah. And, and I wasn't willing to admit that I needed to abstain uh, from using mind-altering substances to really cross the threshold to some kind of freedom. Yeah. You know, and that, that took time. That, that came years later. It wasn't until uh, 2000, 2007. Mm-hmm. You know, and, it, and in that time, I spent almost six years abroad. I, I left the country. I lived and traveled abroad. I taught English as a second language. I lived in... Where were you? Well, I lived in uh, Germany for two years and spent almost another year traveling in Europe and Africa and, and the Middle East. And then I spent a year in Indonesia. Wow. Uh, teaching over there and traveling. Teaching English? Teaching English, yeah. yeah. In private schools. Mm-hmm. And then I spent a year each in Mexico and Guatemala and traveled a lot in that part of the country. And it was, it was very enriching and it was wonderful. Yeah. And I really learned a lot about myself, and I learned 
uh, about other cultures and, and made a lot of wonderful connections with people. But again, I still would find myself in these periods where uh, I was using, you know, and I still yeah. didn't, I still didn't, it, it didn't fit together. Mm-hmm. Then I came back, came back to the country. It was actually 10 years ago. I ended up living for a year and a half, divided up between two meditation retreat centers that were Buddhist. One was in New Mexico and the other was in California. So I'm living in centers where everything is, is, rotates around Buddhist practices, doing meditation, doing the work. And I got deeper and deeper into it. But what happened was I, I was in a, a center in New Mexico where, where it was very isolated from other people. And I injured myself and started using painkillers. Mm. And they, they drank alcohol at this particular place, hmm. a lot of the people out there. And so I was drinking and mixing painkillers, uh, mixing uh, whiskey and Vicodin and codeine. Yeah. Secretively. Mm. See, my history was intermittent periods of isolated using. Mm-hmm. And I continued that there. And I, was, I had a lot of shame. It's like, here I am living at a Buddhist retreat center, but I'm getting loaded secretly yeah. huh. so my my self-esteem was gone and i got really depressed and uh ended up exhausted and i went on a hike now i'm a very experienced backpacker and outdoorsman i mean i would go for days at a time and i could read maps and yeah. do fine but i wasn't i didn't have a clear mind yeah. you see and and i got out and i got disoriented and then i made every mistake in the book you know, the first thing you do is if you're out in the woods someplace and you get disoriented and you don't know where you are, the first thing you do is you sit down and you don't do anything. You don't move yeah. until you get figured out a, a, a rational plan. But I kept stumbling on, got more and more lost. And I ended up spending the night at 6,500 feet in the high desert of New Mexico in February by myself thinking, is anybody going to find me? Fortunately, I had a cigarette lighter with me, even though I don't smoke, and I was able to create a fire to stay warm, and then I made a signal fire in the morning. They had 80 people out looking for me, including a jet, and I built this huge signal fire. I knew how to do that. Mm. And then the jet spotted me, sent the GPS coordinates. Some guys came in. I walked out, and my teacher talked to me a couple days later, and she said, Eddie, what happened? How, How did this happen? I said, I don't really know. And she said, have you thought about going to a treatment center? Because I think you have some old issues and that you haven't dealt with, and I think perhaps you have some substance abuse issues that you haven't you know, really addressed. And I said, sounds good. So I went into a treatment center, and this was a key, key period for me, Dan. Yeah. Because I went in, and you know, when you, when they, they do the intake, right? And they're asking you all these questions. And so, you know, Attica, prison riot, all this stuff. Yeah. So the, the therapist is asking me, and she says, well, how did it feel, you know, after you thought you were going to get the shit beat out of you? And, well, I don't know. I mean, did you experience any, you know, you know, I don't know, questions she asked me, the kind of questions you get asked, right? Yeah. And my answers were like, well, I don't know, and, da, 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 and all of this. And she puts her notebook down and she just leans back and she goes, you don't really, you don't really get it. You don't connect the dots, do mm-hmm. you? I said, what do you mean? She goes, Eddie, you were traumatized. Yeah. That was that's called post incarceration stress disorder. It's a form of PTSD. Mm-hmm. You were traumatized, and then she gave me this sheet of paper that showed all the symptoms. It was like reading my biography. Mm-hmm. Check, 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 check. Yeah, those are all me. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, I could see where every time in my life where I got into trouble was the same pattern of being isolated from other people. Yeah. Uh, a lot of shame and guilt yeah. and didn't, you know, I didn't reach out and connect and I wasn't talking about my feelings, wasn't sharing what was going on, all these things. It was right on down the line every time this had happened. And so it was really easy for her to draw up a, a release program, a treatment plan for me. Yeah. And uh, that really changed my life. It was like somebody had opened up a tapestry on the wall and there's your life. This is what happened. Here's what you need to do. And I've never used again, Dan. You know, really? I've never used again. I, 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 went, I started going to 12-step meetings. 
I started working the program, you know, getting a sponsor, doing the steps. Had and you done any of that before? No. Worked any of the No, I had never been exposed. Program. I'd never been exposed. When I was in Attica, they had AA meetings, but why would I go to that? I'm not an alcoholic, right? Yeah. Well, you were um, really young then. And just... Yeah, and I, I didn't think I had a problem. You know, yeah. I had never gotten a DUI and, and never lived under a bridge. So, you know, what? I don't have a problem. Yeah. Uh, but um, at that point, I realized I had a problem and I needed to admit that uh, this was not something I could do on my own. So I surrendered to the program, and I started working a real program of recovery uh, through the 12-step program. And at the same time, I was meditating. And at the treatment center was a really brilliant meditation teacher named Brian Lesage. And Brian, at the time, was in Silver City, New Mexico, which is where I got clean. He now is based out of Flagstaff. And they were hiring Brian to come in and do meditation. But he also did something called somatic meditation or somatic experiencing. Uh-huh. And so because I, it was determined that I was dealing with trauma, uh, they had me work with him one-on-one. And we did sessions after sessions after sessions. And he took me through these very powerful experiences of, where I was able to go back and deal with these experiences. I had a really, really bad panic attack early on in this that lasted for hours and yeah. that's the last serious panic attack I've ever had. And that was over eight years ago. I've had a couple of times where I've been in situations where I said, all right, uh, I need to go outside or, you know, just felt uncomfortable. But I've never had panic attacks. It was so transformative for me. And then, you know, I, I've deepened my meditation practice. So you were doing some body work uh-huh. in, in the midst of a discussion with the therapist yeah, yeah and and he was kind of walking you through the process yeah and doing some body work at the, at the oh, same yeah, time oh yeah it was body centered therapy yeah yeah and i'm a big believer that that's that's the most powerful work yeah you know, just personally that Me too. uh talk therapy uh, just my opinion i don't think it's enough right not for people who have gone through the trauma and right. so many people have gone through trauma and I think most people who have been in serious uh, behavioral or substance abuse addiction have been through trauma. Yeah. That's, that's my opinion. And yeah. uh, there are a number of... And that's your experience. Yeah, and that's my experience. Yeah. And so the work that I do, the meditation I do, uh, and the yoga I do is very body-centered. Yeah. And I'm still continuing to work around the trauma issue it still comes up every once in a while. I see glimpses of it. I see how it affects me. Mm-hmm. But I'm really conscious of it, and I just drop in and I do the work. Mm-hmm. And it's a constant healing process. Yeah, I like how you mentioned that. That you know, it still comes back, but um, because sometimes it, it seems like we get the idea that we want to just be done with that part and check it off. <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, and be declared in remission or whatever, you know? Um, And while we can have, you know, profound uh, healing experiences that can really help us advance, you know, but it's, you know, our whole totality of past experience is still going to come up at various times. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is stay present, be able to work with whatever comes up. Exactly. So yeah, so so now you've got this this great twelve step framework mm-hmm. and a meditation mm-hmm. practice that you've been working on for years and the trauma been, work and the trauma work and the body centered therapy yeah and the yoga and and other things that I do I really think that uh, the 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 way I eat is really important mm-hmm. sure uh, yeah. learning how to be in relationship with somebody, mm-hmm. uh, learning skills and how to communicate, nonviolent communication. Yeah. You know, all those things are part of the recovery package, the yeah. recovery program. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
you know, now you've, you've really made, you know, another breakthrough mm-hmm. and, and it's becoming even more integrated and, you know, you're, you're experiencing kind of how this has worked in your own life and, and now you're really energized at this point. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then how do, how do, how do things progress for you from here after you've integrated the trauma? And well, uh, you know, when I moved to Asheville six, about six and a half years ago, shortly afterwards, I started getting involved with a Buddhist group here in Insight. It's called Asheville Insight Meditation. Okay. And I started leading, leading groups and doing some talks and, and understanding that I actually had, was becoming a meditation teacher. Mm-hmm. And I was really reluctant to call myself a meditation teacher. And people were saying, no, Eddie, you, you, you've been meditating for over 30 years. You, you can help people. So, okay, I guess I'm a meditation teacher. Also, I started getting involved with National Alliance on Mental Illness many years ago because I have a son, an adult son, who mm-hmm. lives with a severe mental illness. Mm. And I, with my work with NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness, I started becoming a family support group facilitator and working with other people like myself who have loved ones with a severe mental illness, I started understanding the importance of self-care. And what Mm -hmm. happens for those of us is that we're so focused on taking care of the people in our lives who are suffering so, we forget to take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I started talking a lot about that and realized, well, I can do some workshops around that and share what I've learned and use the meditation, show them how to use meditation mm-hmm. and compassion practices as part of self-care, the body-centered program, uh, practices. So I started bringing that in. And then I realized that then an opportunity opened up for me to actually to become a substance abuse counselor. Mm-hmm. And all, you know, it's funny how these doors just open. Yeah. And I, I, apparently I was ready. Yeah. Uh, but I had that vision. I just wanted to use past experiences to help people. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, I'd gotten my, my recovery strong enough, foundational enough, that I felt that I had something worthwhile to share. So I'm now a substance abuse counselor. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm under supervision. Mm-hmm. And so it all, it all comes together now where, you know, I work with people in early recovery and sometimes I do workshops and classes and I bring the practices of Buddhism in in particular into this. And it's amazing. You know, I'm teaching at this residential aftercare program with guys in early recovery and they are responding so well. I wasn't sure how they would respond. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, guys, we're going to meditate. And, you know, are they going to, like, just blow me off? Are they going to... But they do it. Mm -hmm. They do it. And then they come back and tell me how it's changing for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they're starting to do their practice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we did a walking meditation exercise the other night, and I took them outside, and I didn't know how it was going to work, but they were really doing it. Yeah. You know, and, and they come back and say, yeah, you know, and I noticed somebody was looking at me you know, from the balcony, and I start feeling weird, and then I realize, oh, I can just watch that emotion that arises, and I can just sit with that emotion, uh-huh. you know, and, and be okay with that, and not get caught up in the story. And I mean, these are guys that are learning how to use this practice so that they can actually embrace their experience, because mm-hmm. I think it's so important for people in recovery to be able to start learning to develop a relationship with whatever arises in the moment, uncomfortable thoughts, uncomfortable feelings, uncomfortable physical sensations. Because I know in my experience, and I think it's probably true for most people who've been in active addiction, is when we didn't like the way we were feeling, we said, I know how to fix this. Yeah, yeah, right. And that's what we did. And yeah. or as my first sponsor used to say, we got a bad case of the fuck it's. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and now it's like, you know what? I don't have to do that. I can actually sit with this. And, you know, you talk about understanding impermanence. This is where impermanence comes in. This is something that the Buddha talked about 2,500 years ago. It's something that quantum physicists uh, started talking about a little over 100 years ago is nothing is fixed and unchanging. Everything is in a state of flux and, cha- and change. This table that's in front of us, looks pretty permanent, yeah. pretty fixed. Well, guess what? It's not permanent, it's not fixed, 
right. it's changing. Right. And so if we understand this, we understand that whatever thought arises, whatever feeling arises, if we can just sit with it and hold it and embrace it, it'll pass. Right. We don't have to act on it. And that's nice when we're, when we're using a metaphor for our uncomfortable feelings, but it can be frightening, too, to think of our own impermanence that we're going to disintegrate or dissolve. And yeah, yeah. How, do, how, how do you deal with that? Well, I don't think we really learn how to live until we've come to terms with the fact that we are of a nature to grow old, get sick, and die. Yeah. You know, and I don't rub that in guys' faces the first day we sit down and talk. Yeah, yeah. But when that comes up, I don't back away from it. Right. You know, yeah, this is how life is. You know, there's the good news and the bad news. But, you know, if we can just come to terms with it and not run from it, it, it shifts how we look at life. And, and uh, we don't have to live in fear. You know, we can learn to accept things. Right. And, and work with them and, uh, yeah. and have compassion for ourselves. That's a big part right now of, mm. of what I bring is, you know, going through the 12-step process, anybody who's listening to this who've been through the 12 steps, they know that it, it brings up uh, sometimes shame. It can bring up shame. It can bring up sure. a lot of bad uh, feelings. Mm-hmm. Now, if it's done skillfully, uh, it doesn't have to trip us up. Yeah. But if we bring compassion into it, self-compassion, um, it's it's a much more graceful journey. It's it's one that's much softer, and easy, an easier path to walk. We have to connect with that. I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in any kind of healing work that we're doing, it, we have to connect yes. with the self-compassion and, and find it, even when it's elusive. Yeah. Because the shame is is magnetic, you oh. know, it becomes like habitual and it draws, draws us back to, yep. Yep. to that shame pull, but we have to be able to find the compassion to be able to, yep. to work with that yep. Yep. at some point. And when we can feel compassion for ourselves, we can feel compassion for others. Yes, right. And when someone does something that's difficult for us to understand and, and easy for us to be in judgment about, yeah. it's a lot easier for me to say to myself, I know that ultimately that person is in a place of suffering. Mm. You know, uh, I've had people do things and I was able to be in a place where I'd say, gosh, that must be a hard life for this person to be living, to be this angry. Yeah. And it softens it. And, and mm-hmm. rather than getting resentments and getting angry, which does me no good, and could result in me saying or doing something really stupid, I can just go, you know what? I understand. I've been there too. I know what it's like to feel hurt. I know what it's like to feel sad and act out on that unskillfully like this person has just done. You know, whether they flipped me off on the freeway because I didn't get out of their way fast enough or, yeah. or, or you know, wh- whatever it is, you know, I can feel the connection with other people and that just shifts the whole way I walk through life. about meditation we're talking about connection Mm -hmm. compassion and how you you, you've kind of reached these milestones at different points where Mm -hmm. you made little these connections and and integrated things within your own life and with your own experience Mm -hmm. and now you're being able to to really just kind of give that back and it sounds like it happened organically you became a meditation teacher yeah and tell us a little bit more about uh about where that's going now, what that feels like for you. And well, uh, today is, um, is a four-year anniversary that I'm celebrating uh, with Margaret, who's my life partner yeah, and my business partner. Yeah. And, and she yeah. is an amazing teacher. She's a trauma-sensitive yoga therapist, and uh-huh. she's been teaching yoga for 15 years. She also works with pregnant women. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so I've been able to enjoy the richness of, of being in partnership with her 
and and uh, and watch myself grow, you yeah. know, within that. But watch our visions come together. Mm-hmm. And about a year ago, it became really clear to us. Let's we can do some work together. Mm-hmm. So we actually created a business, an LLC. It's called a Mindful Emergence. Mm-hmm. You know, we go through the paperwork and you know create the business and say, okay, what is it we can do? And we've been doing workshops. We do mindfulness and yoga for recovery. Mm-hmm. We're going to be doing some work with uh, around trauma pretty soon. Um, she does work on her own, and sometimes she partners with other teachers. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I uh, team up with other teachers and just try to take our experiences and uh, bring them into the community where they're helpful. Um, you know, and as I mentioned before, I'm, not a subs- I'm now a substance abuse counselor. So what I do is I bring mindfulness practices into treatment centers, aftercare programs. I'm going to be teaching at Buncombe County Jail pretty soon. Mm. And so on. And this is, you know, I, I get to speak to groups. I've been able to, I was able to do a workshop at a 12-step convention last year. I'm going to do it again next year. And Workshop on meditation? Yeah, it was a workshop on meditation uh-huh. at a 12-step convention. Uh-huh. And I had hundreds of people in a room. And I talked to them about meditation. Yeah. Now, I have to secularize this, Dan. You know, I'm not... It depends, you know, you, you tailor what, how you speak to people based on the group that you're speaking to. Yeah. So I didn't talk about the Buddha, but I just yeah. talked about mindfulness practice. And mindfulness practice has been something now that's been uh, used as far back as into the 70s uh, in the medical community, in the therapeutic community. John Kabat-Zinn, right. in his work in the early 70s, and yeah. you have mindfulness-based stress reduction. And then mm-hmm. you know, now you have mindfulness-based uh, cognitive therapy that uh, Zendel uh, Siegel Mm-hmm. And a couple of other gentlemen started. Now you have mindfulness-based relapse prevention by G. Allen Marlett. So these, basically, what, the, what they've done is they've taken the Buddhist teachings and they've lifted them out and they, and they present them in a way so that people who might get freaked out thinking, oh, this is Buddhist and I can't do that because it's Buddhist. They just take to it because they go, wow, this works. Yeah. So, you, you know, you can just use regular language and present it and people take to it and they do it and and uh, so that's what i had to do at the convention yeah you know uh-huh. uh and and people are like meditating and it's like i got hundreds of people in the room okay let's meditate and i thought i don't know how this is going to work but everybody was quiet and they meditated i was like wow you know and the people came up and said that was great and i always wanted to know how to meditate and i didn't know so i was like yeah cool you know this is good. You know, I'm helping people. And so what happens after, after we meditate? What does it do for us? What does it do for you? I'll tell you what it does. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> Not only do I get up from the cushion or the chair, whatever I'm sitting on, and, and just feel more grounded and mm-hmm. calm, but here's the key. When I'm walking around and going through life, I'm much more conscious of what's happening moment to moment. Mm. So I can have little micro mini meditations or mini micro movements coming Mm. out of the yoga practice where I can be at a checkout line. And I know I'm going to be there a few minutes. Mm -hmm. There's several people in front of me. So I just stop and I get a drop into my body and I check in with my breath. And then I say, what am I feeling right now? What are my thoughts? Oh, there's a judgment arising about what's in that person's basket. (laughs) I go, okay, isn't that interesting? I can step back and see it. I don't have to judge myself for that. I can say, okay, what's underneath that? Start doing some exploring. All right, I feel some anxiety. Or maybe I feel some anger. Where is that showing up in my body? Let's just bring my awareness to that in my body. Let's let's just spend some time with that. Mm -hmm. And just watch it change and shift. The impermanence. See? Yeah. The impermanence. It, Jack Cornfield, who is a very eminent Buddhist teacher, said, and he's been teaching for a long time, yeah. he said that if an emotion or a thought arises, it doesn't last more than 30 seconds unless we try to repress it 
or we feed and water it mm. with a story or we energize it. Mm. If you just hold it, embrace it, it'll pass. So I have these experiences or I'm driving, you know, my, my truck and somebody does something really weird. You know, I used to get really pissed off at people that tailgated me. Oh, well, yeah. You know, because I, mean, I, I just don't <laughs> like that. But I'm working with that. Yeah, and, right. and And I just go, okay, what am I feeling? Where is it my body? And just yeah. spend, you know, I don't close my eyes. <laughs> I do, <laughs> yeah, I right. do an open, you know. <laughs> and, and I just drop into that. And just so I can have these little awarenesses. And then I've had these experiences. I had an experience that happened uh, some time back where I was at a meeting. And somebody, somebody went off on me after the meeting. Mm. I mean, I, I don't know what was going on inside them, but they said something and it was really harsh and cruel. And they said it in front of a whole bunch of people and really judgmental. Mm. And I just took a breath and I said, okay, I don't have to react. And I could feel all the feelings, feelings like, well, I'm going to rip them a new one, or I'm going to leave here. I'm never coming back. Yeah. I watched the whole thing arise and pass. And I just sat. And when they were all done, I just said, I'll think about what you said. And uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Yeah. Now, that is a miracle, Dan. That, that's not the old Eddie. That's not the Eddie from 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. That's not the Eddie from 10 years ago. That's the Eddie of 2015 that's been doing this practice, and I can sit there. That's what this practice does, is that when something arises, I can respond in a much more skillful way. And rather than saying something or doing something that I would regret, and you know what happened? Later, they came up and apologized to me. Mm. And we hugged. Yeah. That's, a, that's transformation. It is. And, you know, I, I've had this conversation several times on the podcast already with folks sitting in that chair and uh, some good things that I've heard. And I'm trying to remember uh, who said, I think it was Daniel Nevins, who also gave the uh, supermarket analogy, which is It's which a is great place cool. to meditate. Uh, yeah, right. He talks about how it could be a blessing. But he also mentioned that, you know, when you had that moment when you're breathing deeply after you've been insulted, you know, you're wounded and angry and I saw it and all fearful, arise. You it know, all came like, up. Yeah, it all comes up. And the key was that you courageously breathe through it and then led with compassion all you had at the moment. You know, thank you for your comment. But that was a compassionate comment. It was received that way, obviously, because mm-hmm. they came up to you later and apologized. Mm-hmm. But when you made that comment, you weren't guaranteed that they were going to come up and apologize to you later. Oh, no. That just... It was a lovely byproduct of you leading courageously with your heart and not following the fear. And I just think that's very, that's very interesting. Well, it's, it's a lot more peaceful place to be in. Yeah. And, you know, why, why would I rent space out in my head? Because really, I'm renting space out in my head to people if I let them get in there and, uh, you know, if I play that game, you know, yeah. and I've spent too much of my life doing that, yeah. you know, and I've had to go back and clean up wreckage later and apologizing. Yeah. So, you know, in the 12 steps, the 10th step is basically doing self-assessment and making amends where they're necessary. And I don't have to make as many amends now as I used to. And it's... Mm. You know, and in my interpersonal relationship with Margaret, you know, it's, you know, being in an interpersonal relationship, as you know, it can push your buttons. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we're not always at our best. And so I can't expect her to always be at the top of her game. And if she gets in a place where she says something, I can just sit there and hold it and say, okay, can we talk about this? You know, or maybe she says something and I say, you know what? This isn't a good time for me to talk about this. I just need a few minutes, but I will talk about this. Can we, like, maybe in 20 minutes sit down and talk about this? And she's conscious enough where she'll see, she'll say, yes, yes, of course, thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, because we can cause wounding in an intimate relationship so easily. It's like that beautiful flower. We can crush it. 
Yeah. But when we're more conscious of what's arising and we can just be present with it and be compassionate with ourselves and other people, it just shifts everything. Yeah. And sometimes it's really hard. And sometimes I don't do so well, but... Right. You know, that's the journey, you know? Yeah. We're all works in progress, you know, day to day. And, uh, you know, we're not there yet, you know? But these are the tools. These These are the tools. These are the skills that that we can use on our journey to make it a little easier, to buy us a little time, a little space, a little healing room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I think you've done a really good job of of outlining some of these important tools that you've used in your experience and that have served you and that you're using in your practice now. I, I really appreciate you sharing all this. Thank you for this opportunity. It's yeah, been very rich for me. Thank you for coming out. It's a beautiful it day is. for y'all's anniversary, so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. hope you get to get out there and enjoy oh, it. we will. All right. Well, how do you feel? I feel great. Okay. Great. Thanks. Well, thanks, Eddie, for coming in. It's been my pleasure. Anytime. Okay. All right. That's it. That was my conversation with Eddie LaSure great meditation teacher. His website again is amindfulemergence.com. Man, what a life. What a story. Thank you so much to Eddie for sharing with us this this incredible experience that he lived through and has grown from. And thanks to you, the listener, for tuning in and experiencing this. Really appreciate your support. Check us out on the web, danieljohnsonmd.com podcast is called anecdotal evidence we're also on youtube check us out there and thanks to brian mashburn my editor who put this episode together really glad to have him involved and on board so that's it for now thanks again for tuning in until next time take care it's daniel johnson md